will be discussing the second Senate impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. Followed by a look at the Supreme Court's recent bombshell ruling over church worship amidst the pandemic. And finally, we are committed to bringing you the news, views, and input to go on this episode of the Report Roundtable Discussion. I'm Jorge Flores. I'm Bree Eastlick. I'm Tristan Maglunog. And I'm Amanda Mendoza. As you can see, we are continuing to practice social distancing and are going to conduct our episodes via Zoom for the foreseeable future. Although we cannot be together in person, we invite you all to continue to be a part of the discussion. Follow us on Twitter at the Report CSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our new contents. Starting off with our first story, the proceedings of former President Donald Trump's second impeachment trial have begun. Last month, the House of Representatives charged Trump with incitement of insurrection after he played a key role in leading his loyal supporters into a deadly attack in the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Trump's team filed their first legal brief that argued this trial is unconstitutional because the former president is no longer holding office, further calling Democrats' behavior, quote, political theater, end quote, and dismissing all claims of Trump's part in inciting the insurrection. Trump's attorneys denied House Democrats' request to testify in person. The proceeding will go on without him present. In order for a guilty verdict, 17 Republican senators would need to join the 50 Democrats to meet the 67 threshold or two thirds of votes to convict Trump. On the first day of the trial, only six GOP members voted with Senate Democrats in certifying the constitutionality of the trial. As the fourth impeachment trial in US history proceeds throughout the week, we will keep you updated as new progressions are made. All right, guys, so these past few days have been monumental, a very pivotal moment in our US history. As we know, it's the fourth impeachment trial. The first three were Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and of course, Donald Trump. So what's interesting is that this is the first time a president has been, has been impeached twice. And what's interesting about this uh, specific uh, impeachment is that Trump is no longer holding office. So it comes down to the question on whether it's constitutional to convict a former president. Well, according to Susanna Sherry, a constitutional law expert from Vanderbilt University, the Senate does have the legal authority to hold a trial and vote to convict if they see the fit. Well, throughout history, there have been several former officials who have been impeached and tried even after leaving office. One notable one was a long time ago, but it's worth noting is that in 1876, the Senate did vote on the same question, whether Secretary of War William Belknap would be convicted of impeachment or not, because he resigned shortly before the House impeached him. However, a majority of the senators went forth and voted that he would still be tried but he was later acquitted. But you have to take a look at it at the terms of context. In my opinion, I think the evidence is compelling enough to go forth with this procedures and it's a lot to unpack. So I wanna hear your guys' thoughts. Let's start off with Bree. Yeah, one thing I'm really looking into is how upset people are that Trump has left office and they're still trying to impeach him. But with the Capitol riots happening just a few weeks before he left office, why are we upset with this fact when it happened with just a few weeks after he left office. How are supposed people just to let it go? Are we supposed to just, you know, forget about it and not let him have any consequences? I feel like because the president is set, the presidency is such a high responsibility and it has such a big limelight, people forget that it's an actual job. It is a job. They go through a hiring process just like everyone else. This one is just publicized and entails a very important matters. I saw a tweet circling around the last few days and it stated that if a doctor committed malpractice and retires before it is fully investigated, should the hospital and people that the doctor's choice is affected just move on? No, you continue the investigation, you hold them accountable. This might not keep Trump from running for office in four years, but they have a right to try. Obviously, this has not happened before, but what could Trump lose if he is impeached? According to the former President's Act of 1958, it lays out that presidents are given a pension every year for life. So for the rest of their life, they'll get a pension and Trump's will be around $200,000 every year. It also states that presidents will get protection from the Secret Service. Now, what Democrats are really going for right now is to ensure that he will not run in four years for the House or the Senate. In the end, it's going to be up to the Senate to decide what the successful impeachment will entail. But until then, we really don't know what's gonna happen if he does get impeached. What do you think, Amanda? 
Brie, I really like the comparison you made with the doctor and the president. The president has a responsibility of holding himself accountable for his actions. He has one of the highest positions in the U.S. and some could even argue the entire world. And besides, I think he knew what he was doing when he helped incite the insurrection in the Capitol. Like, for example, he weaponized his words and influenced many people to attack. And according to the Independent, on January 6th, Trump said in his speech, quote, we're going to walk down to the Capitol and we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You'll have to show strength. You have to be strong, end quote. And I can see why people in the White House would be furious because this exchange put everyone's life in danger. And like you said, he has to be responsible for his actions in and out of office. Whether or not he, I think he'll actually be impeached, I don't think it's likely since it's very unlikely for senators to meet the 67 threshold to convict Trump. However, I think it's important that we at least have this trial to show people that just because you're in a high position does not mean you cannot be held accountable for your actions. Totally. Now, guys, this is historic. It's the first time in modern times that we see a president inciting insurrection. Now, from the society's perspective or a student perspective, I will really think that a president who is inciting insurrection should be punished for it. I don't think he's gonna be impeached, but I do think that if Democrats, they are looking and pursuing forward to censor him in any means possible, I'll go for it. I think that's gonna be a big win, not only for Democrats, but also society and our democracy. Also some Republicans, they are in favor of this, of this duty, of this decision. We know that six Republicans, they already voted yes on this decision, only in the day number one. So this means that probably this probability could increase in case he gets impeached. Now, once again, I don't think it's going to be the case, but at least if they get him censored, that will be good and a big win for them. Let's see what happens in the future. Let's see how this situation is going to evolve for the next days. Moving on to our next story, the Supreme Court recently ruled against California's ban on indoor church and worship services late on Friday. Previously, California governor gave a new submission guidelines based on a COVID-19 tire system, which ranged from tire one or widespread to tire four minimal stating quote, those measures were imposed to protect worshipers from getting infected, end quote. South Bay United Pentecostal Church in Chula Vista and Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena were the two churches to make cases against the state and the governor, claiming the ban violated the Constitution and the people's right to exercise free religion. The court has blocked the prohibition of the ban, but is also allowing intercapacity of 25% as well as singing and chanting during the services. Guys, this is another interesting topic to talk about. First of all, because this decision was a six to three vote on the Supreme Court and three justices that voted nay claim in addition that the conservative majority second guesses the judgment of expert officials and displaces their conclusions of its own. With as much of scientific evidence that has been released about COVID-19, it is truly safe to leave this ban? That's a question. If we go from the scientific perspective, we know that even though if it's just a 25 capacity allowance, this is going to increase the probability to get more people infected. Now, their decision on saying, okay, you go guys, you can worship and you can go every single Sunday at your services. This is just meaning that the lift of the ban from public places could go increased for the next days or the next months. What I mean like this is that what happens to other businesses that they're saying, okay, so the decision was for them to open. What about me? What about us? And I'm sure they're going to need or they're going to start making more pressure to the Supreme Court for lift a ban, not only for churches, but also for any kind of other public places. So my question for you is, guys, what do you think about this situation? Do you think it's proper for the Gavin Newsom administration to start lifting these bans? Also, there's a lot of pressure, not only for any politician, but for Newsom as well, because he has two more years. And there's a lot of controversies on whether we should lift the bans, what happens to COVID-19 pandemic, what happens about the vaccine? Is it coming yet? Is it coming today? So what do you think about all of this? First of all, it really is a very interesting decision. Personally, I, I kind of like it actually, because I, I believe that it is safe to lift the ban. Um, we know that social distancing works. We know that masks definitely reduce the spread of the virus. Obviously the indoor activities are a bit of a concern, but it's important to note that they're still trying to keep things at a 25% minimum. 
or maximum rather. Um, but in order, in terms of indoor worship places, I feel like that they should install some sort of like reservation system. Because if you just let people go to a church um, without reservation, uh, you know, signing up online, they're going to be wasting their time when they find out, oh, we reached ca max capacity, you know, that's going to cause other problems. Um, so I think that's one way to solve that problem. In terms of businesses, oh, no doubt businesses, they're going to they're gonna put up a fight to also have the same guidelines as well. But the question is, would people be, would be willing to follow the directions though? 25% maximum, but then businesses are really desperate during these times. They're willing to do anything. We've seen hair salons go undercover even when they're not supposed to. We've seen restaurants with more than 25% of uh, capacity of people. So it really is up to the choices that people make. Are we putting our trust in our fellow citizens to do the right thing or not? So it really is a very tough decision and I'm looking forward to see what's happening next. What do you think, Bree? I understand what you guys are saying. And I do think that it's not really fair to restaurants and movie theaters and small businesses that are forced to be shut down for indoor activities. But honestly, I would feel way safer in a 25% capacity movie theater than a 25% capacity church, in my opinion, which I have gone to the movie theaters when they were reopened a few months ago. and nobody's showing up. Let's be, I'll be completely honest. I was the only one in that theater. Um, so I felt obviously completely safe. I mean, who knows how it would be if they reopened the movie theaters, but as of right now, I would feel safer there. You know, with the vaccine rolling out more and more every day, I am alarmed that people might think that everything's okay now because the vaccine is out. That's not the case. California is not getting enough vaccines in order to vaccinate everyone. Los Angeles alone has shut down five vaccine sites temporarily, including the Dodger Stadium um, because of a shortage. It could take months before uh, lower risk people, including all of us, will be told we can get the vaccine. For example, San Diego County could vaccinate up to 20,000 people a day, but are only doing 10,000 or less a day because they don't have enough. Until we get more, I personally don't think that these things could change drastically because people are not wearing their masks. People are not social distancing. So it's really hard to continue to say we're gonna shut things down but until we get the vaccine, I'm scared that things really aren't going to be able to change as much as we hope to. What do you think, Amanda? Well, personally, I think by opening up churches to a certain extent, also businesses are going to want to open up. Different businesses are going to want to open up. But a point that I found very interesting is that Justice Samuel Alito said, quote, if Hollywood may host a studio audience or film a singing competition, while not a single soul may enter California's churches, synagogues, and mosques, something has gone seriously awry, end quote. And I think he brought up a great point about how unfair the situation might be from the eyes of people who practice religion. And they understand that. But the concern is, if we open up churches, other people are going to want to open up. And it's going to be hard to regulate who can open up and who can't without there being some kind of backlash. So I think I'm interested in what's going to happen soon. However, let's move on to an update on the efforts of the CSUF Health Center. As schools like Cal State Long Beach prepare to receive Pfizer vaccinations, many are wondering if Cal State Fullerton will do the same. However, Orange County has asked that Cal State Fullerton refrain from distributing vaccines for the time being. Currently, Orange County is receiving tremendous help from Disneyland, who is running one of the country's largest vaccination sites on their property. While the county continues to help produce vaccination sites for locals, the CSUF Health Center will be receiving additional funds to further expand their COVID-19 testing capabilities. These abilities include providing free COVID-19 tests to students, faculty, and staff, and the way to trace exposure to the virus throughout campus. So we can see that vaccination sites and testing sites seem to be expanding, and that while CSUF won't give out vaccines, it will still perform rapid testing on campus. However, it's important to note that a large number of students are expected to attend in-person classes when school opens back up in fall 2021. I think that with the resources the school has, they're doing the best to ensure safety by using rapid testing to trace COVID-19 exposure on campus. However, according to the Daily Titan, the city wanted the college to be a vaccination site, while the county requested that it doesn't give out the vaccine. So I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Do you think it's okay that CSUF will be administering testing and not vaccines only to students and faculty? I agree with the decision of CSUF to try to support and have this uh, COVID-19 testing um, site. That will be great, yes, because I see their purpose. However, if the reason for them to do it is kind of like to help students to get testing and that's it what's going to happen on fall 2021 
I think it's going to increase the probability for them and for people to get infected if it's only testing. So I don't really support the idea. I agree on their intentions, but I don't support the idea. I would support the idea if CSUF was trying to have itself as a vaccination site. That will be a different story because now their purpose will be for everyone to get vaccinated and for fall, everyone will be kind of safe or healthy or enough, uh, good enough to attend to classes. No, I agree with you, Jorge. I, I believe that CSUF should accommodate for vaccinations as well as tests. But like they said, the Daily Times said that the CSUF doesn't have the resources available. They don't have the, the people working um, to also do the vaccines aside from the testing. But I feel like they should stress more on vaccinations right now more than the testing because there are a lot more people that are not infected by the coronavirus versus those who are affected by COVID. So if they wanted to somehow you know, have testing and vaccinations while keeping the same amount of people working for them, I feel like they should accommodate it to emphasize more stress upon the vaccinations. So for example, if there are three workers, maybe one person would do the testing and two people would be vaccinations. However, we, as far as we know right now, these tests are only administered to students and faculty who are working on campus, not the community. So that's the problem right there. And in terms of the funds, CSUF may not have the funds to do that so far, but we'll just see what happens next. What are your thoughts on that, Bree? I like what you guys have to say. I love that CSUF is making this accessible for students because it might be harder for them to go somewhere else. You know, it's a lot more convenient for especially students who are right next to campus to go there and they might feel safer because this is a smaller, more regulated site rather than some of these big sites. It, the only thing though, is like I was stating before, is they probably it's probably not necessary for them to have this on campus because we don't have enough vaccines in order to really provide it seems like with five vaccination sites being shut down i think that we need to I, i'm going to i'm going to disagree with you tristan i think that we need to focus more on the testing only because only because we don't have enough vaccines in order to make it even so i believe that we should continue testing and probably make it more of a priority only because we won't be able to make it an even distribution. So it's definitely something that we are going to probably be looking more into with the school and seeing how they're going to um, kind of deal with this, with the shortages and what they're going to do in the future about that. Now let's move on to our next story. Happy Black History Month, Titans. All month long, we're going to feature stories that celebrate the amazing achievements and accomplishments made by Black people this week. We're highlighting legendary actor Chadwick Boseman, who sadly passed away last August from colon cancer at the age of 43. However, he left many amazing projects behind for fans to remember him and recognize his talents and impact on the Black community in, the, in and outside of Hollywood. Most recently, he has just been nominated for four Screen Actors Guild Awards, which has only ever happened twice in the ceremony's 26-year history. Additionally, Bozeman has also been nominated for two NAACP Image Awards, as well as his first Golden Globe for his work on Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Congratulations, Chadwick, and thank you for sharing your amazing talents with us. Bozeman is receiving so much high praise, and it's very much well-earned. His stories and his characters were captivating and emotional, and it's no surprise that he earned all these nominations and awards. Um, he's made so much history and there's been some beautiful tributes as well by his former co-stars Michael B. Jordan and Viola Davis, which shows just how sincere and amazing he was offset. He will always be remembered and has made a lasting impact not only on Hollywood, but everyone else's hearts. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I saw Michael B. Jordan's inspiring post and it, it really touched me to think that Chadwick Boseman posthumously received this many awards, a Golden Globe nomination, two NAACP awards, four SAG awards. It really shows how inspiring he was. It, it really shows that hard work truly pays off. I mean, frankly, to be honest, I didn't know that he had these internal battles with his health because he carried himself so, so strongly and so bravely. And he was just a bold person and it shows how inspirational he was. Like I said, the resilience that he carries will probably be his legacy. I mean, his performances in 42, Black Panther, like we can go down the list, especially with his recent performances in Ma Rainey's and The Five Bloods. Chadwick Boseman is, will, will just go down as one of the most inspirational Black actors out there. What do you think, Jorge? Totally. There's so much talent, and we can just see his example by his life and also after his death. And that means something really important for the Black History Month. So I'm really happy that we're celebrating this month through this 
talents and artists that they are just making history right now. What do you think, Amanda? The fact that he won so many awards even after his death just proves that he had such an amazing impact, not only in the Black community, but in entertainment overall. I think this symbolizes the power someone can have even after they're gone. His acting skills were absolutely out of this world. I've watched The Five Bloods during the summer, and he was such a spectacular and grounded actor. And I think he deserves every award that he was nominated for. Yeah, absolutely. And just so you guys know, we will be doing this every single week. Uh, for the rest of the month as we will be celebrating Black History Month. But with that, it's all the time we have today on the Report Roundtable discussion. Have a safe week, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Bree Eastlick. I'm Amanda Mendoza. I'm Tristan Maglunog. And I'm Jorge Flores. As always, stay fresh, Florida.